Hi, my name is Tona Stevenson, and I was fortunate to manage Sydney Observatory for a number of years, during which I researched Australia's part in the astrographic catalogue for my thesis with the University of Sydney. And I'm here today with Julianne Robson. Hi, I'm Julianne, and I've actually got a background in literary texts, and I particularly work on Oscar Wilde. But as Oscar said, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars, aren't we, Tona? And mapping the stars in the sky actually dates back to ancient civilizations. Here in Australia, Aboriginal peoples observed, named and mapped the stars in scientific and cultural ways. And there's more and more evidence emerging about Indigenous knowledge of land and indeed the sky. One of the people we know about is Patya Garang, who was a young Aboriginal woman. Her language and knowledge was passed on through the notebooks of British Marine Officer William Dawes. When we think about the history of astronomers, we often imagine male astronomers. However, a significant number of women contributed to the knowledge of the stars in the southern sky. They were often wives, daughters and sisters of male astronomers. That's right, but so much of what we know in science is built on measurement and things changed in the late 19th century because to actually achieve this rigorous measurement, a large workforce was needed and this came about with a star mapping project carried out by observatories in different parts of the globe. This enormous effort of mapping all the stars the same way required factory-like conditions, and women were employed to do this. But these women didn't look through telescopes, did they, Tona? They measured the stars, photographed on glass plate negatives for the Great Star Catalogue, also called the Astrographic Catalogue. The way they worked and the instruments and methods they used were developed at the Paris Observatory back in 1890. Indeed, the women working at Paris Observatory were meant to do this work. However, the project faltered due to the number of glass plate negatives to be measured, transport and other costs. Yes, the enormous job of measuring, calculating and determining the magnitudes of stars for stars seen from around the whole globe was too much for Paris Observatory, especially the stars in the Southern Hemisphere. This is the most star-dense region of the celestial sphere and most of the work fell to women in Australian observatories, including Sydney Observatory. Do we know much about these women, Tona? We know a little bit. And I was fortunate to find a small wooden box. It was partially hidden on a very high timber shelf in Sydney Observatory Library. And inside it were employment cards for all who worked there, including the women who measured the stars. On each card is the name of a person, when they started, when they finished, sometimes a little bit more. Julianne, could you start with the first woman who worked? The first card is dated 1916, just after the beginning of the First World War. Ida Dorothy Digby started work in December 1916 at the age of 18. She was the first astrographic computer employed at Sydney Observatory. On Friday the 9th of February 1917, she was gazetted as a junior clerk and her wage was fixed at £50 per annum. Her father was a much-awarded fireman, becoming station master at the Paddington Brewery Fire Brigade, where the family lived. Ida had attended Fort Street School, also on Observatory Hill, so her daily commute to Sydney Observatory was familiar. She worked solidly for 10 years, measuring the stars and calculating their positions. In 1926, when Sydney Observatory's budget was cut, she was transferred to the Department of Education, where she worked until 1938, when she married Keith Baxter. Her catalogue initials are ID. Irene Maud MacDonald also started work in 1916, a few days after Ida Dorothy Digby, and the two women became measuring partners. Irene's catalogue initials are IM. She was also paid £50 per annum, and that was 64% of what a male who did the same work would have earned. Ida and Irene 
measured stars together for 10 years. In 1926, as we have heard, they were both transferred to the Department of Education. Ethel Louise Clements started work on 12th of March 1917. She lived in Burwood and in 1926 she also left, but that was because she was to marry Richard Pearson. Women could no longer work in the public service if they were no longer single. On the 5th of July 1917, at the age of 17, Natalie Claire de Moulin began measuring the stars. She was the youngest of 10 children and had recently moved from Armadale after completing her leaving certificate with honours. She lived in a cottage by the sea in Manly and every weekday and on Saturday morning, she caught the ferry from Manly and walked up the hill through the rocks from Circular Quay. In 1917, the Rocks was a bustling but somewhat squalid neighbourhood. Natalie was fluent in French, and this would have been useful in communicating between Sydney and Paris. Paris Observatory was still the main organiser of this international star catalogue. Her catalogue initials are NM, and in 1920, she was promoted to a permanent position But in 1924, she still had to resign when she got married. Winifred Madeline Cronin was Natalie's star measuring partner and she also began at Sydney Observatory in July 1917 and was promoted in 1920. The women were called junior clerk but in reality they were computers and they measured the stars. In 1926 Winifred was transferred to the New South Wales Treasury as austerity measures impacted Sydney Observatory. Beryl Thyra Mawson began work in 1918 but like the other women She too was transferred in 1926 to a government department. Her catalogue initials are BM. It appears the observatory lost many of its experienced star measurers and computers that year. Here's another one, Susan Oates. She was awarded a bursary and completed her leaving certificate in 1917 at Our Lady of Mercy College in Parramatta. She was awarded honours in English and French and excelled at mathematics, gaining a university scholarship. But instead, she must have needed employment because she became part of a team of six women measuring the stars and computing their positions. In 1926, Susan resigned to marry Harry McLaughlin. Her catalogue initials are SO. But one of the women stayed on beyond 1926. And here is Mary Alice Allen, who was employed in 1923, and she worked on the Star Catalogue continuously for 23 years. She must have been devastated when all but herself left in 1926. In 1930, she got a new measuring partner, who she no doubt had to train. At the age of 17, Carol Arkenstill began her daily travel from Petersham to Observatory Hill. The recently completed Sydney Harbour Bridge stymied the work of the observatory due to vibrations from trains that crossed it nearby. Carol would have seen many changes from Observatory Hill, including horse-drawn carts replaced by more and more automobiles, but the methods for measuring stars and determining brightness and the calculations they used did not change. And there were other women who worked at the observatory during this time. Beth Makara was employed in 1937 as a librarian because there were so many books and journals coming through on the new astronomy techniques and new discoveries about the chemistry of stars and stellar distances. Muriel Mills also began work in 1937. And the government astronomer presented a strong case, supported by the international astronomy community, that the astrographic catalogue must be completed. In 1939, the war brought new challenges for Sydney Observatory. The government astronomer drew up a list of items to be given priority for relocation to a new site in the Blue Mountains. Of highest priority were astrographic catalogue glass plate negatives. Ethel Wilcox was employed in 1939 This is a great photograph of Ethel Wilcox and Mary Alice in 1941, taken for an article in the newspaper about the Star Catalogue and the revival of work at Sydney Observatory. According to Winsome Bellamy, who we'll hear about a bit later, Margaret Wilson, who began work in 1941, was a very bright and capable person. Wilson was one of the few to stay on at the observatory after she was married, and Wilson is her married name. Harley Wood, the government astronomer, 
who completed the astrographic catalogue, made special note of Wilson as deserving of acknowledgement in the completion of the astrographic catalogue. In 1942, Marie Blanche Tierney joined the measuring team. This was in the midst of the Second World War, and even though the Japanese submarines bombed the harbour in 1942, the observatory did not relocate, and the women continued to work on. When the war ended and a day of celebration was declared on the 2nd of September 1945, Marie Blanche Tierney and the other women and the male astronomers had the day off to celebrate. And then Barbara Mary Carmel Dignam began work in 1944. She was a typist and noted in the Employment Gazette. She worked for 16 years until 1960, playing a significant role in preparing the catalogue now for publication. Marguerite Brown began work in 1945. She was an astute young woman who was attracted to work at Sydney Observatory because of the detail and precision required, and it was more challenging than other types of work available. The government astronomer, Harley Wood, had injected new life into the project and new challenges. He was taking over the completion of the Melbourne as well as the Sydney part of the catalogue. Yes, Harley Wood had a financial commitment from the New South Wales Ministry to provide the resources to complete the astrographic catalogue and also money from the International Astronomical Union to print them. In 1947, three more young women, Jean Margaret Campbell, Nancy Joan Nolan and Patricia Lawler, began work in earnest doing the final measurement of the stars at Sydney Observatory. But by this time, the old measuring machines were worn out and they were replaced by a new style of machine, a little easier to use. Here's a photograph of Winsome Bellamy, who we'll now hear about, using this new machine. It must have been a buzzing workplace when Winsome Lillian Bellamy, Renee Gladys Day and Verley June Morris joined the measuring team in 1948. The six young women, all in their late teens, looked like they were having a great time and formed firm friendships. Look at them out eating their lunch on Observatory Hill and apparently they played table tennis and shuttlecock. Winsome took this photograph of the women during their lunch time. She and Margaret Wilson and a number of other women saw the astrographic catalogue through to its conclusion. Bellamy and Wilson's work has been acknowledged as being fundamental to the completion of the Sydney and Melbourne astrographic catalogue zones. And so many weddings. Verley married in 1954 and Winsome and some of the other young women went to her engagement and then wedding. This happy occasion also meant that Verley left the observatory However, the friendship between her and Winsome stayed strong until they were both in their late 80s when Verley passed away. In 1954, a number of new young women joined the work. By this time, most of the measuring was complete, but there was a lot of administration to compile the catalogue. Dana owner Paltaro Kate began work, but she lasted only for four months. Yvonne Donoghue joined and she stayed for less than two years. The work might have been actually quite boring by this stage, and Shirley Wall and Rosalind Jean Logan also became part of the team, and they managed to stay through to the catalogue's completion. There were also tragedies, and in 1956, the women noticed Patricia Margaret Lawler behaving unusually. With the type of work they were doing, which required persistent attention to detail, this became obvious. Nonetheless, they were shocked when news came that she had a brain tumour and then passed away a few weeks later. But the work continued, and the final volume, Volume 8 of the Melbourne Zone, was sent to the printer in 1961 and published in 1963. And the last of the 52 volumes of the Sydney Zone stars was completed in 1964. Yvonne Welsh, Janice Lorraine Hawkes, Elizabeth Julianne Vigold, Rosalind Norell Bleakley and Anne-Margaret Davis assisted Wood in these and the final catalogue which was an explanation and a summary published in 1971. These employment cards don't say much, but they represent the stories of women who had no tertiary training in astronomy, but who together measured and calculated the brightness of over 740,000 stars, not just once, but at least twice and sometimes more times to ensure accuracy. Was it worth it, Tona? Well, the legacy of this great star catalogue 
has been debated, but it has now been proven because the catalogue combined with others is used to guide space telescopes such as the Gaia and Kepler mission. These missions provide greater knowledge about the stars and now their planetary systems. But even at the beginning of the project, one of the lead astronomers said that the true worth may not be realised for 500 years or more. And perhaps he was right. At least today, there are more women leading these missions, playing important roles in the analysis, and perhaps one day they'll receive equal pay. Well, I do hope so, Julianne.